So, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I propose that uh, we start uh, again uh, now for session five, communication and transparency. I hope you all had a good lunch. Uh, uh, just to let the, uh, colleagues online know, we still have a half empty room here, so I think uh, many colleagues are still uh, finishing their lunch, but uh, we need to, uh, to continue. Uh, and um, uh, I will immediately uh, give the floor to this session's moderator, Engvild Knudsen. She is the co-chair of thematic working group two of the HMAMA task force on availability of authorized medicines. And uh, she is going to um, give uh, moderate this session and give a brief introduction to start. So, Engvild, over to you. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Monica. Um, very pleased to welcome you to this session where you all warmed up with all the questions you had on previous sessions. So I think this will be quite interesting. I'm, I'm really pleased to just echo what's already been said about transparency. Transparency is paramount for trust. I just have my slides now. Um, we need trust in the regulatory system and we need trust in national healthcare services. And we communicate in order to support healthcare professionals and patients in shortage situations, just to keep the patient-focused perspective there. In my experience, attention from the general public and media is often triggered by individual experiences with shortages. As regulators, we need to respond to questions, but also proactively identify the target audiences and the right channels to communicate and reach them with information they need. Open and transparent communication is important in many aspects of our work. Indeed, also between regulators and regulators and the industry or the market authorization holders. Our messages to the public need to be according to the national context and in line with risk assessments. Information from or in cooperation with market authorization holders and actors in the supply chain is therefore very important. Together, we do our best to enable healthcare professionals to provide the best care and information to the patients. As you will hear from my colleagues from the EMA presenting the network priorities, the working group on communication in the task force is primarily addressing public communication with healthcare professionals and patients as the target audience. And for the record, this includes veterinarians and animals too. We are looking at ways to enhance our communication related to supply problems and shortages and promote good practices. More recently, there has been a growing concern for increasing number of shortages and specifically shortages of antibiotics, as you will hear from my colleague Diego, who will present the amoxicillin case from Spain. But I would also like to add, from the positive side, an increasing interest among the public for the reasons for shortages and the work by European and national authorities. A lot has been done in order to make information about shortages more accessible. Good practices have been identified and tools provided, but we need your perspectives in order to improve according to your needs. So please help us to identify new opportunities and ways we can improve. So with this, I would like to leave the floor to the first speaker of this session, and that is um, Marco Koroniak, President of the European Liver Patient Association and Co-Chair of EMAS Patient and Consumer Working Party. Please take the floor. Thank you very much for the floor, Chair, and for excellent introduction. I just need a clicker. Thank you. I will use this uh, few minutes I have for the presentation for just making two points. And one was uh, listening to all the presentations, all the stakeholders. There is one question, and I should do a presentation, not the question, but the question that I have in mind is whose fault is it? So who is there to blame to the shortages and what is happening there? And it's obvious that it's no one's fault. Or maybe on the other hand, it's everybody's fault. Whatever we say, it's clear that this is a very complex issue and only with working together with all stakeholders, we will able 
we will be able to tackle it. So prior to go to dive in the communication and transparency, we should do like an introduction or just to remind ourselves why are we here today and why are we doing what we are doing. So if you can see the slides, you can see the members of the patient and consumer working party working closely with EMA. And now just a few words of uh, reminding us what is happening. So the impact of shortages of medicine on patients can be significant and potentially life-threatening. The problem of medicine shortages in European Union can have a significant impact on patients' health and also well-being. When patients cannot access the medications they need, their condition may worsen. They ca this can lead to complications, hospitalizations, and sometimes even death in some cases. So patients may experience delayed or interrupted treatment, reduced effectiveness, alternative medication. Uh, they could see increased out-of-pocket costs, and of course, of top of that, also psychological stress. So addressing the issue of medicine shortages in a coordinated and comprehensive manner is for patients essential to ensure us to have the access to the treatment we need for their optimal health outcomes. We have four things that we can discuss. If we have delayed or interrupt treatment, we can have time longer to wait to receive our medication, and in this way, our treatment can be interrupted. So this can lead to a worsening of uh, the condition uh, or maybe require additional interventions to man manage. So if we have reduced effectiveness of the drugs that we are taking, so we are unable to access specific medications we need, we need to switch to alternative drug. And switching can be sometimes be more or less effective or has some other side effects. So increased costs. So sometimes you need the, to go elsewhere to search for medications that are not available where you live. And this can be costly because usually it's out of pocket expenses. So last but not least, the psychological stress. So if you are not able to access medication you need, you need, you can experience also significant psychological stress and anxiety which can worsen uh, our health problems. I will try to avoid all the topics that were already discussed today, and I will just point out some topics that were not discussed today, just to add a little more to the complexity of the issue. So I, I, I tried to chart out everything that was said. So we have, we have like a shortage catalog, we have national leg registries, and when I was listening to all the presentations, I, I got a feeling that we have everything. So nothing is there to change or to, to have a, a dis different approach. But when, when you look deeply and when you review, for example, the presentation of a patient representative, Francois, in 2018, it is clear that some points were raised. They, they, they were not dealt with. And with COVID crisis, they just worsened. So, for example, one of the points was that we should strive to have manufacturing production in European Union and we should not rely on outside partners. And with COVID-19 and shortages of medicine and everything that we have today, it's clear that this is one point that was shown in 2018, but we should work on it for, in the future. So I will try to avoid the points that were already said, but on the general, so we need a better system of exchanging information of the available drugs between member states also. But this causes a problem because member states decided that they will sovereign govern their healthcare systems. So we are trying to impose on them something that maybe is a conflict in, in regards of sovereignty. So we need a clear message from all stakeholders from this workshop and, and for every press think from, from here on that this will not interfere with the sovereignty of member states where they, were, where they decided on having their own healthcare system. Of course, we need to better understand in the system to know where is the disruption in supply. But I learned today, which I was not aware of, that not just supply is the problem. You have many, many different points of a problem of the, the, the shortages. 
So in regards, it, it would be great if we can have a clear overview of the causes of shortages from the start until the end, because then we can try to tackle this, this problem. And we had also like discussed a long range of direct and indirect um, causes that are related to shortages. Just to name a, a, an example that was uh, that was uh, spoken to me when I was um, interviewing members of the Patient Ecosuma Working Party. For example, if you can produce a drug but you have problems with, with, um, uh, with packaging or ink, which is produced in other countries, you have other problems. So I learned today that we have many points that we, we need to discuss. And one of the important points is the coordination and communication at different levels. So communication from EMA, communication between different stakeholders, communication in the member states, in the regulatory authorities. And I'm hoping that after this all presentations, we will dive in to the last point that I will make today. And the last point is just so prior to the last point, languages, this is obviously a problem. If there is a shortage of drug and you purchase a drug from a neighboring country or you go to the neighboring country, it should be uh, possible for you to read the package leaflet or anything connected to the drug in your own language because languages can be a problem. As you remember, a few years ago or several years ago, European Union decided that every citizen of European Union can have a right to access healthcare in any EU country. So the question was, should we then have a central country with all the drugs and we will just all go there? And the answer is, of course not, because this will be a, a source of all other problems. So we need to strengthen the healthcare system of member states. So sharing their information with, with all different stakeholders with not intervene with their sovereignty in healthcare system, it will strengthen it. Uh, so, and the last point, and this is the point for opening discussion at the end, so it's stockpiling. So how much of information should we share or should we not share? I know from my perspective, if you share that something is not there, my mother will go and she will buy a lot of this. Just in case, just in case something happens. So how to share information without creating a problem of stockpiling? It looks like that we need a strategic communication. So who will get what information, when, how, and why? Uh, would be the answer, which is a little complex answer, but would be the answer because we need to be ready to produce information that will uh, increase the transparency, but lower the possibility of the stockpiling of medicine. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marco. Um, now I'll introduce uh, Jean-Francois Dullier, He's presenting on behalf of the industry associations. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting us to, to this uh, workshop, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, I talk on behalf of uh, several uh, associations representing industry. Um, first, how is organized the communication at the moment we are uh, supplying information on a mandatory base or voluntary base, or we do not supply information to national competent authorities. The national competent authorities have a uh, connection with uh, HMA, EMA. The industry and the national competent authorities as well are uh, communicating with healthcare professionals and patients. And we have a separate bubble, which is the media, and we need to take care of that. Now, if we move to what could happen uh, in the future, uh, first, I would like to move the green facility in between HMA and EMA, between HMA, EMA, and the 27 national competent authorities. Like that, uh, industry could communicate in the same way with national competent authorities and or EMA. Uh, we will have the same, uh, we have a, a simpler way of uh, communication with healthcare professionals, patients, and we will need to consider as well the media. Now, who are the, the stakeholders uh, involved and uh, requiring uh, 
communication and transparency. I will start with regulatory authorities, and we have national competent authorities, we have EMA, we have government because they could have an impact on the, on the, on the situation. And we have as well the need of a global communication with global health authorities, like that we could have communication between uh, Europe, US, and uh, Asia Pacific. This is what happened during the, the pandemic. We have as well, so the industry. Industry re represents manufacturers and represent as well the distributors. We have an important point with are the patients, and we have as well the healthcare professionals. And we have introdu introduced a, bub a bubble for the public and media. Now, we need transparency, but we need an appropriate transparency, which is the link between all the stakeholders linked to the communication and transparency. And we could have some opportunities. What are there? How to establish an early and ongoing communication regarding potential and existing shortages? This point has been underlined many times uh, today and yesterday as well. Second point, how could effective communication across global health authorities, government be improved to mitigate specific disruptive events in typically global supply chain. We all know that industry is more and more global. We are producing API in some areas, uh, drug product in others, and this is uh, really an important point and we need to tackle uh, drug shortages uh, improving this. How could, as well, harmonization and coordination between NCAs to allow to product reallocation and reduce product transfer for the benefit of the patient? This occurs in some countries where we, have, we, we can see some uh, restriction to di the distribution of the, of the product. How to build and maintain the confidence and trust through messages delivered by health authorities and or industry. And this is really a key point. And we need to transfer the information as well in the right way to the media. <clears throat> Maybe we need as well to train us and others where they can find the information, because the information is somewhere and could be available. Now, we, we had a link with uh, Stefan this morning, um, link between how to <clears throat> prevent drug shortages and communication. And what is the role of geopolitical factors and the influence from the media? <clears throat> now, what to share with whom? For transparency, we need to have some requirement. We need to have consistent definition and interpretation of these definitions. We have talked about direct short, uh, shortage definition. We are not, we do not have all the same definition. We need as well to have an, an alignment on the same reporting expectations, e.g. impact, timelines, volumes into the member states. And as we share, as industry and the other stakeholders, um, data, we need to keep a full confidentiality of the data submitted, for instance, volumes, sales, forecast, demand, these are, these need to be addressed as well. We need to have a transparent and timely communication, and this should inform all stakeholders to minimize the impact of actual supply disruption. So again, a good communication. 
we need to focus on aligned industry, association, regulatory communication that share relevant and useful information to the public to counter misdirecting media reports, which could bring huge impact on shortages, unnecessary hoarding, which, is, which have as well a huge impact on the shortages. And we need, through this system, to avoid patient confusion or decrease of confidence in their medicines. Now, to summarize, <clears throat> how can we communicate to limit panic and hoarding? We, will, we need to leverage big data, ensuring the confidentiality. We need as well some harmonization through convergence and standardization. Sameness concept, we need dialogue and streamline communication. All these items are moving through all the stakeholders. We are all part of the same problem and talking together, we will maybe solve it. And we could have a better predictability on the increase of the demand and the supply. And as well, working together, we could provide relevant and useful information to the public. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Jean-Francois. Um, I'd like to introduce Rosa Giliani. She's, the European, she's in the European Society for Medical Oncology, and she's also co-chair for the EMA's Healthcare Professional Working Party. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for having the opportunity to um, present uh, uh, the perspective of uh, the um, healthcare professionals. In uh, this case, I think I've been quite selfish, and I will present the perspective of this healthcare uh, professional. So just to, to disclose um, from the uh, very uh, beginning. So. The first point, I mean, communication, if you think about, is everything. So what does it mean? It's uh, with uh, people we, we want to communicate with. It's the concept that we want to communicate. So the first act, the first act of being selfish is that uh, I really want to communicate this important point to me. I'm very happy that we are discussing, we have this discussion about um, shortages that in a way has been, uh, let's say, um, supported by the unfortunate health crisis that we had. But uh, let's remind that uh, um, uh, shortages are experienced uh, by um, um, every field, basically, in, in the healthcare sector on a regular basis. And uh, these shortages in the uh, oncology field, which is my field of expertise, are basically um, mainly related to uh, inexpensive uh, cancer medicines, which are medicines that uh, are uh, basically essential, are indispensable uh, to uh, treat and many times cure um, uh, cancer, many different type of cancer. So this is the very uh, important point. So it's not just only a discussion about being prepared about the next crisis, it's what we are experiencing on a, on a uh, routine uh, basis. The, um, the other point is that uh, there was already some comment has been made yesterday about uh, uh, the discussion around the list of the um, essential medicines and the list of medicines that uh, are um, uh, that, that, that undergo shortages and this is why uh, because the inexpensive cancer medicines that again are used in, uh, in the oncology field 80 percent uh, of the uh, basically um, WHO uh, essential cancer medicine are the inexpensive medicine that are uh, used so that's why there is some uh, let's say perceived overlap 
gapping between uh, this definition of different uh, type of, uh, of list. And I think this is a point uh, that uh, we need to further uh, clarify and understand better, but because I was confused myself yesterday when we start uh, uh, mentioning all uh, uh, different, uh, different lists. And um, what is really interesting, another point that is really interesting about shortages is that uh, um, we know from many pieces of uh, work that has been, have been presented also this morning that basically they are um, experienced at different extent across the European Union, but they are experienced in every country. So this is a, just a, a very a quick snapshot from a work that has been uh, um, uh, performed by the um, uh, European, uh, European Society for Medical Oncology, ESMO, in collaboration with the um, Economist Intelligence Unit, about uh, profiling five European countries and uh, um, shortages, the issue of shortages, problem shortages was found uh, in uh, uh, countries such as Germany and as well in uh, Romania. Of course, in some countries, the uh, problem of shortages uh, can, uh, um, let's say, magnify uh, what uh, is already an issue and can uh, make uh, more visible, more understandable, and more important uh, inequalities that certainly we don't want to, to, to be there. Now, coming back to, going back to the communication, uh, what I, as a healthcare professional, I found very positive so far is that uh, finally we are talking uh, openly and extensively of shortage um, that have become uh, basically the core of discussion at the clinical level, scientific level, and political level. And this is very good. And the proof uh, in our meeting today, our workshop uh, these two days, is the, is the proof of it. Then I think if I have to, <clears throat> I, I was tempted to change my slides, and then I say, no, I don't want to be cheeky, I don't want to, I mean, I wanna, let's do it as I thought uh, from the very beginning, because the first point is that, yes, we have a strategy plan, we will hear but we have already heard and we will hear more about the strategy plan to address shortages, which I found beautiful, maybe not perfect, maybe not what we want, and it's something that we may need to refine, but we have a plan, which I think is important, and we finally move forward, but maybe not listening at the comments of yesterday and today, from the discussion around what is a shortage that I found, uh, you know, a bit uh, of a problem. I mean, we, we need to move at some point from that discussion, but maybe not. I mean, we can, cont we can keep discussing, but we can do also other things at the, at the same time. Another point that is very important to communicate, have a clear mind and communicate from the point of view um, with respect to the shortage in communication is that this is a global uh, issue. As a, is a, it's a global dimension that we need to, to tackle and consider. And I fully understand, actually, after um, the explanation and the clarification that Lorraine uh, Nolan gave, gave us yesterday, I understand a bit better that, of course, there is nobody wants to decide what every member state thinks is better to address shortages or which are the shortages for the, every specific member state. This is not in discussion. But actually, if we just look around us. This is a problem that is experienced at the global level and methodology in addressing the this, this problem, I think, needs to be global. And I'm happy that this has been already mentioned and that we are moving in that, uh, uh, in that direction. I'm very happy about the, um, the, the, the fact that several times has been mentioned the need for this systematic dialogue between a European institution and uh, um, uh, institution and uh, national uh, member states. And of course, the dialogue uh, it needs to be inclusive. Now, this is very nice to say, but then we need to understand and how inclusive we want to be and how we can uh, really make it uh, uh, for uh, real. So not just having people in the room to say that it's inclusive, but actually have an active uh, uh, participation. Um, I'm very happy, and this is something that uh, is important about the fact that we reckon that shortage is not just a matter of snapshot of profiling a country or doing a survey. This is a continuous problem and as such needs to be continuously uh, monitored. And I think that we need to pay in a bit of more of attention and discussion around the root causes because there are many, of course, this is very well acknowledged and there are different solutions. And also in terms of communication, this may have 
implication. So I think that internal communication, if we manage to, uh, let's say, uh, Mary used this, this word that I like very much before, it's cascade. If we are uh, in the position to start this cascade and convey this point to an audience that is definitely wider compared to what we have in the room, this is already, uh, this is, will be already a very good uh, uh, first step. All these points, many of which I have clarified during the workshop, needs to be clear to, um, to um, many. So, again, this was another point when I say maybe I need to, well, then I say, okay, no, let's leave it as it is. So, I was, my starting point was, okay, so we have a consensus about uh, communication and transparency, but actually during the presentation and the comments and the question that I heard, maybe I'm not sure that we have a 100% consensus. So um, maybe this is not the case. But in any case, let's assume that we have a consensus about the importance of communication and transparency, which of course I, I fully support. For me, the point, in my view, the point is uh, what we want to communicate. So what is the aim of communication? Communication is everything. So do we want to communicate to raise awareness? Do we want to raise an alert? Do we want to seek for the feedback and opinion input from different stakeholders? Do we want to share solutions? This is communication. So it's a, we need to have a structured plan to address how to, uh, you know, to, to, to tackle this point. Then who is the recipient of the communication? There are different stakeholders. I reported some, some, of, some of them here. For instance, I didn't report the, the, the media that have been quoted uh, uh, a few times, uh, um, a few times th this morning. So, do we want, again, I think this is a crucial point, do we want uh, a um, uh, constant uh, communication uh, with all stakeholders at the same time? Do we need to envisage uh, parallel communication? This is something for discussion. And then the channel of communication. I like some, uh, someone made the remarks before saying that uh, it's up to us, it's our responsibility basically to, um, uh, to um, um, bring forward the concept of communication. And as has been already mentioned, the fact that we want a coherent communication, cohesive communication, because if I start saying something, then there will be someone else that will say com something completely different, will generate chaos. I'm not saying that we have to say all the same thing, because we're not be necessarily in agreement, but I think that we need to have a plan well structure for communicating uh, because otherwise we will generate really um, chaos. So of course the type of communication that uh, it's uh, difficult to me to find effective is that if I receive a phone call it happens to be fair in the past not recently saying uh, Dr Giuliani we run out of this drug how do, we, do you want to proceed? Uh, well uh, I do not know I mean it's a bit too late to discuss how do I want to proceed so uh, this is certainly a type of communication that is not effective, then there is a sort of, uh, let's say, more passive communication, which is uh, Dr. Giuliani that uh, um, uh, uh, sign in the mailing list from a regulatory agency and receives so the, the list of the drugs that are in shortage. It will be informative, but uh, I don't think that this is the most uh, relevant, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, form for me to be part of the communicative system. Or also, it's very important to know where to find information so, for instance, about uh, the, the um, shortage, uh, the, the catalog of shortages. But again, this is something more, uh, let's say, reactive or passive, certainly not proactive. And also in terms of communication, I think that we need to, to find this useful. And then what uh, Mark was already uh, hinted to and also other presenters is about, uh, you know, the communication, the very uh, clamor, um, the very... Uh, you know, com the, the, the communication that is like sensational, like if I read this title, Europe is running out of medicine. So I was thinking my mother will go with M Marco's mother to the pharmacy and they will ask for the, you know, the full list of everything. Okay. But possibly I will go with my mother too, because I mean, if I read Europe is running out of medicine. Okay. Let's go. Let's do something about it. And of course, I understand why it is published this way, but maybe uh, we need to be ready to, uh, you know, to, 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 um, I don't know, 
but no counteract or uh, having a more informative uh, discussion. And this is one of my last uh, points, is about uh, what I meant uh, about the targeted discussion. Uh, you know, oncologists are always thinking of targeted treatment, precise treatment or whatever. So this comes also with communication, right? So for instance, uh, with shortages, I'm not saying that people uh, and uh, all stakeholders do not have to be part of the discussion, but I'm saying that uh, if we know that the shortage is caused by uh, a procurement uh, uh, problem, maybe as an oncologist, uh, I'm, of course I want to be informed, and of course I want to help or whatever, but maybe I'm not the most uh, relevant actor in the discussion uh, about how to, uh, you know, to solve the uh, this issue or to communicate this issue. So uh, it's not a way, it's not because I'm lazy, but it's because we need to also understand uh, if we want to proceed with an effective communication that is actually hesitating in an outcome that we think it's, uh, is important. And uh, again, uh, um, we need to understand how to balance this all commerce model for communication with other, with other models. Uh, and also Marco already well explained that is important depending on who we want to communicate to the, 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 the language style and so on, and the channels. Uh, this is a sort of Pandora box because uh, includes uh, the, um, uh, the media, as we said before. So everybody knows me a bit better, um, uh, is aware of the fact that I'm a big fan of Harry Potter, and I think, once again, the answer is there. So timing is essential, is important, and of course there is no point in discussing something when we are already in a crisis, uh, uh, in a crisis situation, but definitely Definitely an early discussion, wherever you know, uh, wherever is appropriate, um, it's uh, it's definitely uh, more useful. And this is just to inform you that uh, within the um, healthcare professional working party that I have the huge privilege to uh, co-chair, um, there is a, um, currently an uh, ongoing uh, uh, work um, about the and the discussion about uh, shortages, with uh, also uh, comments and the um, let's say not revision, but but comments with respect to the guidance. Um, I am not in the position to present this morning, this afternoon, sorry, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the work because it's not finalized yet, but it's just to tell you that uh, uh, the, the group will uh, uh, come up with, uh, um, with a um, well-defined uh, uh, position about um, shortages, um, hopefully. And uh, with that, I thank you for the attention. I'm happy to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. And I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who's Diego Pernas. He's head of communications and PR in the Spanish Agency of Medicines and Medicinal Products. He's also a member of the thematic group uh, two on communication in the task force. And I would like to add that he's also chairing the working group of communication professionals within the HMA network. Thank you, Ingmil. So I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna explain the example of the amoxicillin case in Spain. I'm gonna try to make a timeline of the actual shortage and also the communication we have to deal with because it's not always the same. And I'm gonna go with, the, with a very specific presentation, the periodic pre uh, amoxicillin for powder for suspension because it was the one that made the biggest media impact. And after Ingbill presentations, you may guess how did I first notice this shortage? And exactly, it was my mother who asked me because she read in a local newspaper. And this is the newspaper, actually. <clears throat> and I didn't know anything about this. And actually, that's not a problem or a malpractice. I mean, I cannot un learn about everything. It's too much. But it makes it makes us think that we have to be a little bit more sensitive with the media attention. I'm gonna give you some details about this um, specific case. In Spain, there are three marketing authorization holders. Two of them even produce it in Spain, and the both of them had problems at the same time, basically the perfect storm. One problems with labeling, and the other one had delayed with the paper supply, and also it become it come with an increase of pediatric respiratory infections. And what we did as the regulatory agency was authorization of substitution of in the pharmacy office, uh, informate the healthcare professionals, patients, media, and also the marketing authorization holders 
increase their man manufacturing, manufacturing capacity. Actually, they were producing like 24-7 for quite a lot of time. But the interesting stuff is this. Um, the two timelines are in parallel, but they don't start and finish at the same time. Actually, the first notification, it was in, <clears throat> in October, and my mother asked me the 10th of November when the, actually there was no uh, official communication of the second and the, sec and the third marketing authorization holders. And that's when it started the media coverage. We didn't, we didn't have any official communication yet. We have it a week after that. We talk a lot with a lot of media. We talk also with influencers because maybe you can recognize the date. It's the um, European date for... Uh, antimicrobial resistance. So we have a lot of media coverage pointing to us. Good or bad, we have to decide that. But also we had to send a second press release a week after that, when actually the manufacturing problems were solved. And that was when we have more media attention. And that was why it's important to have these two timelines in, in mind, because actually from that point, we have a lot of media attention in shortages in general. I mean, not only amoxicillin, but all antibiotics. Actually, in January, EMA with uh, European Commission and HMA did a joint statement, but we have a lot of information. Actually, the media coverage has, as they say, there are no medicines in Europe. And maybe that's what we need to learn about that the media timings and the shortage timings are not always the same, but that's not the question. Not every shortage gets new coverage, but all of them impact in the public opinion. That means that every sim simple drop means that it's raining and every time we have to come with it. And also we have to inform every time because shortages can imply changes in consumption, prescription and distribution patterns. And I'm not only talking about stockpiling, of course we're talking about stockpiling, but we are talking also today in illegal selling, in online selling, and we have to be proactive with that. We have to be proactive, we have to be transparent, and we need to improve our internal communication, not only inside our agencies, but also with EMA, but also with all the stakeholders, and we need to be more sensible. Um, communication regarding shortages needs to be thought, and I think the good thing about this is that we are thinking now about it, needs to be thought in a long-term perspective. We cannot only think about media coverage when there is a shortage, but we need to think about it when there is not. And I think with this specific case, we can start learning and maybe applying some of the lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. I'd like to introduce the next session, uh, which is about the network priorities to 2025. And uh, here we have uh, Juan Garcia Burgos, who is the head of public and, public and stakeholder engagement department in the EMA. He's also my colleague in, um, in the communication um, working group, um, co-chairing. Uh, and... Um, we also have Inga, who's also my EMA colleague in the communication group. And she's also, she's a medical writer and she's also in the public and stakeholders engagement department and member of the thematic working group, of course. So please take the floor. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, with the background of the, um, of the presentations um, that were just given, I would like to give you an overview of the, um, of the, the work of the task force, um, which has been done to improve um, communication and transparency. Um, to highlight the um, publication of the, um, of the, um, of the um, working group on communication on the um, good practice guidance on communication directed to EU authorities for for the public. 
also highlighting the uh, EMA uh, catalog, the role it plays and the plans for improving uh, communication and transparency as reflected in the, um, in the work program until um, uh, 2025. So um, communication is a, is a key aspect of the work of the, um, of the task force. It relates to improving access to information on shortages and enhancing uh, interaction with the um, uh, and communication with the uh, uh, stakeholders, um, focusing also, uh, especially on the external stakeholders, so patients and healthcare professionals. So, as you have uh, already heard uh, yesterday and today, today the task force is in a in a landscape that's uh, very different to 2016 when it was first set up. There are new opportunities with the um, uh, with the extended mandate, uh, which brings new tools to deal with shortages. Also, um, obviously, the uh, revision of the pharmaceutical legislation. Um, in addition, there are um, of course new challenges uh, with the um, with the increase in shortages since uh, since COVID and um, post uh, COVID. So shortages are on everyone's mind, and communication and transparency is uh, is more important than ever, as you have heard um, throughout the day. So there's not a day um, that goes uh, by without the um, with shortages in the media, as was illustrated by um, by Diego earlier, and they affect everyone, and they go beyond uh, the EU. And on a on a personal level, I've also experienced um, uh, this uh, situation just uh, two days ago when I was. Um, I couldn't get the um, the um, analgesic solution for my for my nephew who was in a lot of um, uh, pain um, due to an otitis. So it really, I really um, it illustrated to me there the um, the anxieties that um, uh, a parent or patient can go through when they cannot get uh, their medicine. Um, there is a delay in treatment and. Um, and uh, when you have to use an unfamiliar um, um, medicine, which obviously leads to all the uh, problems that were earlier illustrated. So timely information is uh, really essential to ensure that um, patients, healthcare professionals can plan and, uh, and avoid um, treatment interruption. Um, to ensure a timely switch to an alternative and also um, ensure that uh, patients get the necessary training so that um, parents uh, get the relevant instructions uh, on the alternative, how to use it. Uh, if it is a formulation for an adult that needs to be um, that needs to be somehow manipulated, crushed uh, to give to be given to the children. Um, in addition, uh, so information the needs it needs to be appropriately uh, framed to avoid any undue alarm and and to prevent stockpiling. And I think um, regulatory authorities are in a, in a good position to. To give a balanced approach and to give the um, a reassuring message, so not only highlighting the shortage, but also that the shortage is being dealt with, and there is an alternative, and it is a limited shortage. That's the ideal uh, scenario, of course. So open and transparent communication between uh, regulators, healthcare professionals, uh, is essential to improve preparedness, lessen the impact of uh, the shortage and help to maintain the trust uh, in the uh, regulatory system, which is very important to ensure the collaboration between uh, all stakeholders. So um, what has happened since 2016? Um, through the work of the task force, it was possible to, um, to collaborate with the um, stakeholders and to exchange um, practices of, of communication. And the analysis of, um, of these practices and the analysis of feedback also from, from the stakeholders led to the um, publication of the good practice guidance, um, which um, defined and gave recommendations for communication um, to the public. Uh, the guidance led the foundations for increased transparency across the EU. And we have already come a long way, but um, there is obviously uh, more that can be done. So just to, um, to uh, highlight uh, key aspects of this guidance, it is, um, was published in, uh, in 2019. It is directed to regulatory authorities and it gives uh, the key uh, recommendations for, um, for communication to, um, to the public. 
It aims to promote good practice by increasing uh, visibility and accessibility of information on, um, on shortages. Um, it, uh, it provides for a harmonized approach um, for publication across the, the network. It highlights um, the need for, for timely and up-to-date information, all while promoting a, um, a multidisciplinary approach within the regulatory body, but also fostering more interactions with, uh, with the stakeholders. So the key recommendation of the, um, of the good practice guidance is, um, is the uh, systematic uh, listing of shortages, or otherwise known as the shortage catalogue, um, which uh, targets um, the, the public, but also the um, healthcare professionals for, for human medicines. It also addresses uh, veterinary medicines, and here the target is the, um, the animal owner or the veterinarian. It encourages um, early um, publication to allow um, planning and continuity of care. Um, but obviously, that can only be done uh, as early as sufficient information is available to, um, to communicate. So early involvement uh, of stakeholders is also key to obtain advice and feedback on, um, on alternatives and recommendations and also to get their feedback on the, on the key messages. It also addresses um, dissemination and, and uh, channels for cascading, as was used earlier. Uh, and here, um, the focus is on uh, using organizations, um, journals, uh, newsletters, uh, electronic prescribing systems, and, uh, and media, including social media. So this uh, slide gives you a, a snapshot of the, um, the shortage catalog uh, at EMA and what it looks like. It was set up in 2016. It currently only addresses uh, human medicines. Um, we, um, uh, it has a specific uh, publication criteria, so any shortage that affects one or more member states where um, recommendations have been issued um, by EMA's um, uh, committees, usually in, term, in form of a DHPC, will be published there. Because of the criteria, not all shortages are, are reflected there, or far from there. Um, and that's why um, uh, the catalog is linked to the national uh, catalogs. So this provides users with a way to access uh, information on shortages um, for all of the EU, and it gives one, uh, one entry point. Uh, so this is a, a temporary solution until a more, a more permanent solution um, uh, can be found in, in the way of a one-stop um, shop for all shortages. So although there is no catalogue for uh, veterinary medicines, uh, we do have a registry for, um, for the veterinary catalogues at, uh, at national level, which can also be found on the EMA website. So um, at this point, I'd like to hand over to um, Juan Garcia, who will take you through the, um, the work that the task force has done in terms of monitoring um, and uh, uh, future steps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inga, and good afternoon, everyone. I will complement um, Inga's presentation with a future look on which are the actions that currently the task force has in its work program in terms of communication and transparency, and which we hope are able and uh, to capture some of the comments and the, and the concerns which have been raised uh, by previous speakers today here in this session, but also during uh, previous discussions and yesterday's discussions. And I think we all agree that uh, communication and transparency is crucial in order to manage the situation in such a complex problems. So, one of the priority actions we have been put in place and we have been working on is to try to monitor communication practices across EU. This is important because it's a way to measure how things are progressing according to the guidance that we originally developed and produced together with stakeholders. And of course, we agree that on the need to progress and, and make um, things better, but when we, we make a survey, uh, what we were uh, not surprised, but in a way uh, is uh, satisfied of the way that 
the, the different efforts member states have been putting in place in order to increase transparency and to be more proactive and open in terms of shortages. What we have done in 2018 and 2020 is to uh, do a survey and analyze communication practices in the different authorities. And when we saw is that the, this concept of a shortage catalog, which was introduced quite a few years ago, uh, in 2018, it was um, available in 74 member states and has increased to 81 in 22. For veterinary medicines, the, 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 the increase is even more dramatic from 27% in 2018 to 40% in, in 22. In 20, sorry. So uh, around 50% of authorities in the member states have implemented changes or plan to implement them. And about 41% uh, uh, of uh, regulatory agencies are doing so for veterinary medicines. So in short, I think there is already a lot which has been done by member states, even if maybe it's not sufficient to address the concerns and the issues that we have seen. And um, some exploratory work with uh, patients and healthcare professionals point out that the future changes should provide maybe more information about uh, available alternatives on, or advice to patients or healthcare professionals on what to do in each situation. And this is what has been highlighted. Maybe it's not provided with this information and it's an area where we can all maybe improve. So we are about to launch the survey for 2022 and to try to measure whether things are improving or how th they are in the different member states, but also we have combined with some analysis from patients and healthcare professionals how they feel this is progressing. And uh, we can share some of the results. This was done with eligible organizations at EU level, but they were asked to disseminate this within their members. So uh, in a way to try to uh, widen as much as possible the number of people responding. And uh, uh, when we ask about how much they are aware of EMA catalog of shortages or the national shortage catalog, you can see that the level of awareness is very, very low. Uh, when we ask about how do they feel that this information uh, has improved over the last years, uh, again, I think there is quite a, a mild response. Uh, up to 41% uh, healthcare professionals respond that yes, but there is still clearly a lot to do in order to meet their needs and the, 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 what they need to really empower them. Information, however, is found to be useful and uh, from six to eight, uh, they responded that what they found in these catalogs is actually of use for them. Up to 35% of patients and healthcare professionals indicated that they need to have more information on alternatives and even on cause of shortages in order to be able to act and, 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 and take the decisions that they need. So where are we looking at now in 2025? I think we will continue making efforts in order to promote and monitor implementation of guidance. We want to, uh, we all agree that the guidance is, is right. We will update as necessary to incorporate, uh, but we need to ensure that it is mm, implemented properly. And uh, we will continue doing that. We have highlighted that there is a need to enhance communication and transparency. And I think the recent events with the amoxicillin, for example, has, has given a good example. And I think even what, uh, what Diego has presented is clearly early communication is critical in order to manage the shortage. And it is true that maybe uh, looking back now on the lessons learned of the amoxicillin, uh, we were working on it, but maybe we didn't communicate uh, upfront. And this is something where we want to, to improve. We need to intensify stakeholder interaction. That's the reason why we are here discussing, but definitely I think there is not so many elements such as shortages where working together and collaborating is so essential in order to be able to progress. And then I think we agree on the complexity between the European level and the national, authority, at the national level. The fact we have been listening to it, how the situation is not the same in different member states and even regionally. So I think, in order to make a proper link between European and, and national action, we have a good opportunity now to collaborate in the context of the joint action of shortages. I think uh, it's a complex issue, but hopefully we can make progress in this, in this regard. So um, when we talk about how to really come with uh, enhancing communication and transparency, uh, we will very soon come with a proposal how to really formalize that. But we agree that we need to communicate uh, better on the work done at EU level to prevent and manage shortages. So in this respect, I think we have to distinguish between transparency and active communication. Uh, 
Um, for transparency, we will we are proposing, and the discussions are maybe to try to have earlier publication of minutes and even highlight key aspects of our work so that everybody has uh, this information available uh, early enough. And then in terms of communication, uh, following on what Inga has, prepared, has presented, we uh, are aware that the scope and the information provided in our catalog is very limited and maybe need to expand that. The work that the Spoke Working Party is doing now is a good opportunity to have to try to do that in a structured manner. And again, we hope that very soon we are able to uh, communicate more through the catalog, to provide more information on shortages on individual products. We fully are committed to remain honest, open, and uh, we acknowledge that is the only way to foster trust. And, and then we highlight again the complexity and the, the need to really balance and contextualize this information properly. And I think it has been highlighted the risks that communications have in the area of shortages, but maybe that's not the reason not to communicate. We need to do it in a way that we all collaborate and uh, there is a call for all stakeholders to, um, to work together and to be responsible in order to manage perceptions, to manage also relations with media and ensure that the information is well tailored to the different needs. Another aspect is about uh, the guidance on prevention and shortages. There are many elements which are related to communication in this guidance, such as the importance of campaigns to raise awareness, uh, how information can be used to avoid worsening shortages, uh, where to find a specific information on, on shortages, etc. I think what we have to realize is that we cannot expect shortages to be communicated through uh, public, um, public statements all the time. I think very, very often it's about transparency. Very often we have, we have seen how the information in the catalogs is useful, but we have to acknowledge that individual patients have a lot of difficulties to access this information. Maybe it's not as friendly as it should be, and we can improve there. We need to uh, train and facilitate patients and healthcare professionals to access and use better this information, and at the same time to make this information more friendly and more accessible by everybody. So in conclusion, um, we believe that we have to not only look at what is needed, we have to acknowledge that uh, there has been a lot of efforts at national level and across Europe in order to make information more accessible. But we acknowledge that the current events and the recent events have demonstrated is not enough. We need to go further and to be more proactive and to react earlier. Rather than react, we need to be maybe more, more uh, proactive. So um, we will enhance information on the catalog and we will enhance overall transparency. We hope again to come with a package of measures that uh, will be put in place. And I think we need to continue promoting and monitoring good practice. We need to um, promote how people can access this information. And we have to intensify our interaction with healthcare professionals. I think we have heard and I fully agree that um, the, the different stakeholder needs are uh, needs to be addressed separately. Communicating on shortages maybe is not, not uh, one size doesn't fit all, and maybe the complexity is how to, to really tailor to uh, what every stakeholder needs. That's something we will need to reflect further in the future, and we hope that we can continue doing it together. So thank you very much, and uh, well, we go now to the panel. Thank you, Juan and Inga, and I will now open the floor for discussions. And do I already see some hands? Yes, the ladies in the back, uh, okay. Um, we'll start on this side, and I'll promise to come back to you on that side. So, uh, you from the, uh, you're a pharmacist, I think I remember, yeah? Thank you. Um, I think we have not reached a consensus yet about transparency and communication because I heard the regulatory authorities asking for timely notification or early notification. Those were the two words I've heard consistently. And then I, uh, the patient organization asked the same. And then I saw on the slide of um, Mr. Dullier uh, open communication of the actual shortage. But I think the actual shortage is not the same as the timely notification. And in terms of not making things worse and having trust, 
I would really like to see that a trustworthy authority such as the EMA can send out a press release of an upcoming shortage and what is going to be done before uh, the first parent at the pharmacy counter noticing the drug is not there for their child and then having a fit. And then you get the press and the media that likes to have sensation. And you have to be before that. We all know the press and the sensation seeking. I, I would like that to see, to see that. And anyone may comment. Thank you. Um, I think we all agree that early notification of potential supply disruptions is important. Is there anyone from the industry who would like to respond? Maybe Juan. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point, and I hope we have an agreement and a consensus. I think we, I think it was highlighted in one of the slides. I think we have to distinguish between public communication and then what is coordinated communication between all the stakeholders. And I think it's essential that we all share information so that we are all well prepared, and uh, that way will allow to have early communication. So that I think whenever any issue comes to media, we are all prepared. I think that's what the, we hope to be able to achieve. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we all agree we have consensus on that. Thank you. Um, Josie Drabwell. Um, we live in a commercial world, whether we like it or not. And the last three years, we've had COVID then a year of extreme pressure on energies and fuels. Now, all that has increased the cost for manufacturers. And, um, and I was wondering if perhaps there is more expectations of companies who will cease to exist because of that. And also, is there a possibility to have an at-risk list of companies that perhaps are producing medicine that are really, really essential, who perhaps are not economically so stable. And then we could be one step ahead. Would you like to respond, Monica? Yes, I, I think we need to do it the other way around. So first we need to establish the EU list of critical medicines, and then we can look then at, at, the, at the companies, as you say, so looking at vulnerabilities in supply chain for, for those medicines. Yes. Sorry. I hope that was me, sorry. So Rosa Castro, I'm from the European Public Health Alliance, a member of the patient and consumer working group. So thanks a lot. I mean, it's been an extremely intensive day of learning. I have a, one question, which is because it seems that this um, issue of communication and transparency is more complex even than it seems at first sight. And my my particular question is what is being done, if anything, to bridge and to bring the, the experience and the knowledge, the evidence in other areas? Because, for instance, we, we heard a lot about the building trust through transparency, and this is not obviously shortages is the, the topic today, but th that happens in other areas. And vaccine hesitancy, which is not a very, very um, um, far away field, for instance. So I'm, I'm curious to know if like some sort of behavioral studies, learnings from other areas are being brought or otherwise to throw that, that idea. Um, and uh, linked to that is also, for instance, experience from other countries. So like I've heard from uh, New Zealand, for instance, the publication of um, the list of producers of APIs and uh, and producers of, of medicine, is there any plan of having a similar kind of publication that will allow a little bit what was mentioned this morning about AI um, kind of uh, producing or targeting the products that are more as, as most at risk, but that that information, instead of uh, remaining in the private arena, can be brought into the public to, to give more trust? Thank you. I think that question about APIs are very interesting, but I'm not sure if is there anyone here who could respond to that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely, I mean, <laughs> something that we are very much looking forward to, uh, to collaborate and get experience from other parties. I think, you know, we have a lot at the moment, a lot of priorities to implement. And, and one of these, of course, implies uh, we acknowledge that uh, shortage is a global issue and we will continue to really learn uh, from experience. And, and we have a lot of mechanisms to discuss uh, internationally. Um, regarding the, the other aspect you say and, and behavioral, and I think it is true, it links not only shortages and we have applied some, some uh, learnings from the pandemic and uh, any crisis situation. And um, there, there is also, there is always a, a consider shortages can be a crisis and it is indeed a crisis. So some of the elements that we learn in this respect can be, a cri to, can be applied to a crisis, to a shortage situation. And the most recent, for example, of amoxicillin one is, is a good example of it because it, it's a quite, it, it, it really reached media in a way like not other shortages do. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's something that we will, we will need to learn about that. The gentleman in the back, Jaco. Thank you and thank you all presenters. Jakub Velik, Czech Republic, uh, National Competent Medicine Authority. I would elaborate more about the first question because I have the same feeling that uh, we all, let's say, asking for early notification. It's highlighted in the legislation, uh, national, national, also in the directive that it should be done at least two months in advance. Uh, it was stressed that the compliance of the of the industry is uh, is uh, let's say on sometimes low, sometimes very low level. So the question to the industry is exactly is why it is not a key performance indicator in the benchmarking of the pharma industry and why it's not, it was not mentioned in your presentation because as was mentioned by, by many, it's, it's really key point for us is for early mitigation and uh, possible solution. Thank you. So to answer your uh, question, we have uh, talked about this uh, this topic uh, during the preparation of this uh, of this slide. Um, <clears throat> we are living in Europe, and we do not have all the same regulations. So in some countries, it's mandatory to submit the the information on the supply, and uh, the companies are making the the work for that. Uh, in other countries, it's it's not mandatory. And uh, time to time, it's difficult to, to make the things um, available for everybody in all countries because we do not face the same shortage in each country. And uh, this is, uh, this is a, a problem of, uh, I would say, harmonization across our, uh, our market. Thank you. I think we'll need to go to the audience online. We have Walter Morocco from EFPC. Please take the floor. Hello? Yes. So good morning. I am Walter Morocco of the European Forum Primary Care. I am a GP, then a prescriber, and I thank you for the interesting uh, session. Specifically, I agree with the intervention of uh, Mary McCarthy and uh, Giuliana, uh, Giuliani, Rosa Giuliani. Uh, I think it would be helpful if EMA also invited the national authorities to provide timely shortage updates to healthcare professionals through their management software with the relevant alternatives available. I think this, this would help patient not become disoriented. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll leave this for my EMA colleagues to answer. Yes, uh, thank you for the um, for this question. Um, so this recommendation to um, to yeah, alert healthcare professionals through existing um, national systems. I mean, it's, it's one of the um, the recommendations of the good practice guidance on prevention. Um, so, yes, that's um, 
it is there and um, and uh, yeah should be implemented. But obviously there are a lot of challenges uh, to do that. Thanks. Okay, I think we need to move to this side. Francois, please take the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, so some situations where communication is, is difficult or non-existing, um, the end of a shortage is often not communicated. Technically, it should be easy. Uh, you register, while well, you go to the registry of uh, national shortages, you sign up for products for which you, you hope to have an update, and then you receive the information, but it's not implemented, maybe in Denmark, I don't know. Um, but the, the, the thing is that the shortages don't uh, end in all countries at the same time. And sometimes the, the solutions uh, which are found are different in different member states. But we need to, to have that information, we need to know. And second difficulty for targeted communication to patients and to their organizations, um, when um, the medicine is used off-label, then the off-label population um, cannot really receive the information they need on measures or when there are solutions, the solutions might not fit uh, for their for their needs. Um, maybe it's a new product that explains the withdrawal from the market of a product which is also used off-label in some rare disease, but then we don't have <clears throat> the possibility to, to use the, the, the new product, etc. And, and lastly, one good example, one good practice, and this is in line with the discussion we had on the 12-month notification of a company which anticipated years in advance and discussed with patient organizations and clinicians more than a year ago for a withdrawal which is planned for the end of 2024 because in the meantime, uh, they know a product is likely to reach the market, so they will end for the national pricing negotiations. Uh, to uh, end before withdrawing the, the product from the market, which means years before of planning and anticipating on on uh, the withdrawal. Okay, thank you. I know that we do have, as a best practice, um, advice that you should um, um, have information about the duration of the shortage. I don't know if you want to complement that. Uh, Thank you. I think it's indeed a, a very good point. Uh, it's a complex one, as you say, because sometimes the situation in different member states varies, so it makes it even more difficult to communicate on something which is changing. Uh, but we, we take note and we try. For example, in our catalog, we try to indicate when the when the shortage is, is, is terminated, is, is finished. And I think that the, 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 the ambition here is to make it more, let's say, accessible and more dynamic and that people can also link to the to the websites of the different member states so that they can know exactly which is the particular situation in each member state i think uh, practice have improved uh, in this direction but we are we, we have to acknowledge it's a very challenging uh, element to communicate so it's, it's it's good that you raise because we need to all be aware of that and try to make our best even if we know it always will be limited the, the other point you say about the off-label is, is, is important, and I think, uh, yeah, this is really maybe going to the, the even more challenging situation. And we have a few examples of uh, situations like that, and it's difficult because it's, we are not covered by regulation in this respect. So I think we need to a little bit be imaginative here. And then thank you for raising this uh, good example. I think we also not have to look at the, 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 short, the, the downfalls, but also good examples which shows and can illustrate how can do how we can do all better thank you i think we need to continue this in the next session but uh, so please bear with us i'm standing between you and your coffee so maybe we can have a chat when we're having coffee as well uh, i'm just going to be very brief in the wrap-up i think that um, I will just uh, not surprisingly echo Diego when it comes to proactive communication transparency, but it needs to be balanced and context. And we need balance and contextualization. We need increasing awareness of available channels and sources for information about shortages, which I think is quite important. It, that's the only way we can counteract misguided um, uh, reports from the media and so on. But maybe we need to create more awareness about the reasons for shortages and maybe more on prevention to, um, to be um, transparent in what, the work we do. 
Um, we also have to continue to promote good practices on public communication, even though the, the situations might differ between countries, the key principles applies. And also I heard inclusive and active dialogue, and I think maybe this is something the, the member states need to take into account, that you need more dialogue with uh, stakeholders within your uh, member states. Thank you. Thank you for, to all the speakers and thank you for engaging discussion on this session. We'll continue afterwards. Bye.